and welcome to Chapter 49, Hazardous Materials Lecture. The material provided in this chapter is intended to help you understand a hazardous materials incident, as well as help you understand the consequences to a person or persons who may become exposed to the substances and where you fit into a hazardous materials incident. Okay, so let's get started. Hazardous material is defined as any substance or material that is capable of posing an unreasonable risk to human health, safety, or the environment when transported in commerce, used incorrectly, or not properly contained or stored. Our civilization requires manufacturing, transporting, storing, using, and disposing of tens of thousands of potentially harmful substances each year. Operating at a hazardous material scene presents challenges that you don't normally encounter during a normal EMS call. The potential for you to be exposed to a toxic substance and turn into a victim is there, and handling exposures properly and with confidence is needed. So let's talk about some rules and standards. Okay, so regulations for responding to hazardous materials incidents are created by the U.S. Occupational Safety and Health Administration, so OSHA, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA. HAZWOPR stands for Hazardous Waste Operations and Emergency Response and is the OSHA document that outlines the hazardous materials response competencies. Training levels found in the OSHA regulation are the first one is awareness, then it moves up to operations, then technician, then specialist, then the incident commander. Okay, so first responders at the awareness level should have sufficient training and experience to understand what a hazardous substance they are and the risk associated with them. Also to understand the potential outcomes of an incident and to be able to recognize the presence of a hazardous substance be able to identify the hazardous substance if possible, understand the role of the first responder's awareness individually in the emergency response plan, and determine the need for additional resources. Consensus-based standards can also help guide responders. So NFPA 472 is a standard for competence of responders to a hazardous materials weapons of mass destruction incident and NFPA 473 is the standard for competencies for EMS personnel responding to hazardous materials weapons of mass destruction incidents. All EMS personnel should receive appropriate hazmat training. The appropriate training is based on the needs and requirements of the authority having jurisdiction and the local EMS agency. The level of training will dictate when and where you will use your EMS skills. Training in hazardous materials is conducted in three levels, and we mentioned these on a the, uh, couple slides ago, but the first one, of course, is awareness, second is operations, and then the third is technician. Federal, state, and local regulations and standards govern the use, storage, and transportation of hazardous materials. Okay, so let's talk about paramedics and hazmat incidents. When on scene of a hazardous materials incident, you must rely on training and references as sources to help you respond. Know how and when to access specific information. You want to be able to um, access reference sources, the Poison Control Center, Medical Control, and the HAZMAT team. Understand how a hazardous material scene is organized from a command and control perspective and where you fit in. Familiarize yourself with the different types of personal protective equipment, how patients will be decontaminated, and how to access and treat exposures. You may be called on to support teams through on-scene medical monitoring. A hazardous materials incident may include, but it's not limited to, say a highway or rail incident in which a substance is leaking from a cargo tank or rail car, a leak fire or another emergency at an industrial plant, a leak or rupture of an underground natural gas pipe, or incidents in an agricultural setting 
buildup of methane or other byproducts of waste decon in sewers or sewage processing plants, or even an incident with criminal intent in which the suspected hazardous materials agent is intentionally released. So let's start talking about the scene, ensuring your own safety in the presence of a hazmat material. So it may not be possible to identify what hazards are present. You may be able to recognize the threat from warning signs. So signs and symptoms from patients on scene or placards or labels found on the buildings or trucks or rail cars or drums or other storage vessels. Sometimes containers and vessels aren't labeled properly though, or the labels can be misleading. So maintain a high index of suspicion during scene size up. You may be well into the call before you have a firm grasp of what is happening. You may be able to identify leaks or spills by a visible cloud or uh, a leak or spill from a tank, container, truck, or rail car with or without hazmat placards in place or an unusual strong odor in the area. Some chemicals are odorized to indicate the presence of normally odorless gases, such as propane and methane. Some chemicals can only be detected by air monitoring incidents in, or instruments, and that's carbon monoxide. Never rely on your sense of smell to identify the presence of a hazmat. You should suspect the presence of hazardous materials if you approach a scene where more than one person has collapsed, is unconscious, or is in respiratory distress. There will be times when your ambulance crew is the first to respond. So if you notice any signs that suggest a hazardous material incident has occurred, stop at the safe distance upwind and uphill from the scene. Once you rapidly size up the scene, isolate the hazardous area the best you can. So deny entry to the affected area and call for additional resources such as law enforcement and fire department, a hazmat team. Once your safety is ensured, you may begin the process of identifying victims and beginning patient care. If you do not recognize the danger until you are too close, leave the danger zone immediately. Once you have reached a safe place and reassess the situation, provide as much information as possible when calling for additional resources. You want to tell them your exact location, the atmospheric conditions, if appropriate, the size and the shape of the container or cargo tankers, the exact name of the substance, the chemical ID number or symbols if visible, the number of victims, the type and number of additional resources requested, the location of a safe staging area, and the location of the instant command post. Don't re-enter or leave the hazardous area until a hazardous materials team clears you. So let's talk about identification. Information at a hazardous materials incident may come in the form of observations, reports by bystanders, signs and symptoms of victims, labor labels and placards, shipping papers, or safety data sheets. The most recent edition of the DOT's Emergency Response Guidebook, or ERG, should be carried on every emergency response vehicle. The ERG is a guidebook for first responders during the initial phase of a dangerous goods hazardous materials transport incident. It provides information on specific properties of hazards and substances, what is shown on placards, and recommended isolation distances. There are nine DOT chemical families recognized in the ERG. And let's talk about those um, different chemical families. So the first one, the class, is explosives. The second is gases. Third is flammable combustible liquids. Fourth is flammable solids. The fifth is um, oxidizing substances and organic peroxides. Sixth is toxic substances. 
7 is radioactive materials, class 8 is corrosive substances, and class 9 is miscellaneous hazardous materials and products, substances, or organisms. So the marking system. The U.S. DOT marking system is characterized by labels, placards, and markings. They are used when materials are being transported within the United States, and the same marking system is used in Canada. Placards are diamond-shaped indicators. They're placed on all four sides of the vehicles carrying the hazmat, and they identify a broad hazardous class the material inside belongs to. So it could be flammable or poisonous or corrosive. United Nations or North American coding system. So the most common are placards and they show a four digit number for identification of hazardous materials. Labels are smaller versions of placards. They're placed on individual boxes and smaller packages and only refer to the potential hazard in that particular box. The DOT system does not require that all chemical shipments be marked. Most often, there must be a certain amount of hazardous material before a placard is required. You may also identify hazardous materials in transport from the bill of lading or freight bill, or the way bill or consist which is carried by a conductor of a train. Dispatchers can assist by collecting more information from organizations like Chemtrek. Chemtrek stands for Chemical Transportation Emergency Center. Chemtrek has an extensive database of chemical information to assist emergency responders. When calling Chemtrek, they want the following information. So they're gonna want the name of the chemical involved, the name of the caller and a callback number, location of an actual incident, shipper of the manufacturer, container type, rail, car, or vehicle, the shipping carrier's name, receipt of the materials, and location or local conditions and the exact description of the situation. The Canadian equivalent of Chemtrek is C-A-N-U-T-E-C, and that's the Canadian Transport Emergency Center. And then the Mexican equivalent is C-H-E-M-T-R-E-C, and that is S-E-T-I-Q. So fixed facility marking systems. NFPA 704 is the standard system for identification of hazardous materials for emergency response. It outlines a marking system used for fixed facilities. The system is characterized by a placard, which a set of diamonds are found on the outside of the buildings or doorways or fixed storage tanks. The diamond shape symbol is broken into four smaller diamonds that represent a particular property or characteristic. The placards are colored and indicate specific hazards and information. So the red is a fire hazard. The blue is a health hazard. White is specific information. Yellow is reactivity hazard. And each small diamond is rated on a scale of zero, which is no hazard to four, which is a severe risk. At permanent manufacturing or storage facilities, you should obtain a safety data sheet that provides basic information to help save lives later. So it's gonna have the chemical makeup of the substance, the potential hazards, appropriate first aid, and other data for safe handling. This figure shows an example of a safety data sheet for liquid nitrogen. Okay, let's talk about containers next. And that's any vessel or receptacle that holds a material. Often there's no correlation between the color of the drum and the possible contents. 
examples of how hazardous materials are packed or stored or shipped are. You could, it could be in a bag or a drum, high pressure gas cylinder, or a railroad tank car, maybe plastic bucket or cargo tank or pipeline. So it's divided into two categories based on the capacity. So you have either a bulk storage vessel or a non-bulk storage vessel. When it comes to bulk storage vessels, these types are fixed tanks, highway cargo trucks or rail tank cars, also totes or intermodal tanks. They're found in buildings that rely on and need to store a large amount of a particular chemical. And they're secondary contain containment an engineered method that controls spilled or release product if the main containment vessel fails. Then there are large volume horizontal tanks. So they're common. They're referred to as above ground storage tanks and also underground storage tanks. They can hold a few hundred gallons to several million gallons of product and they're usually made of aluminum, steel, or plastic. When it comes to totes, they're also common. They're referred to as intermediate bulk containers. They can hold um, between 119 gallons to 703 gallons. They're portable plastic tanks surrounded by a stainless steel web. They can contain any type of chemical, hazardous shipping and storage, and no, there usually is no secondary containment system and it's difficult to patch the leaks due to the steel webbing around the tote. Okay, so the next bulk storage vessel we're gonna talk about is the intermodal tanks for both shipping and storage. They hold 5,000 to 6,000 gallons of product, can be pressurized or non-pressurized, and usually shipped, stored, and returned to the shipper for refilling. Then there's non-bulk storage vessels, and so all, there's all types of containers that aren't bulk containers. They can hold a few ounces to 119 gallons of product. They include drums, bags, compressed gas cylinders, solvents, industrial cleaners, and compounds. And then you have drums. They're barrel-like containers. They store a wide variety of substances. And they're made out of low carbon steel, cardboard, stainless steel, nickel, or other products. The construction of the drum is based on the nature of the chemical. Then you could have bags. They're used to store solids and powders constructed out of plastics or paper or plastic lined and specific information on pesticides bags. So you have to have the name of the product, the active ingredient, a hazard statement, total amount of the product in the container, the manufacturer, EAP registration number, EAP established number, and a signal words to indicate the relative toxicity of the material. So they want to have either the danger or warning or caution words on them. And also um, they have to have the practical first aid treatment and directions for use agricultural use and precautionary statements on them. And it has to say, keep out of reach of children. Okay, carboys. These are transport and store corrosives and other chemicals. They're containers made out of glass, plastic, or steel, and they can hold between five to 15 gallons of product. Then you have cylinders. They hold liquids and gases and a ver of various substances in unisolated compressed gas cylinders, and the sizes vary. So roadway transportation of hazmat or hazardous materials. The most common transportation of hazardous materials is over land. A cargo tank is a bulk package that may or may not be permanently attached to a motor vehicle. Okay, so this DOT-406 flammable liquid tanker is the most common and reliable transportation vehicle. It transports liquid food grade products, gasoline, or flammable and combustible liquids, 
It's oval shaped tank pulled by a diesel tractor. It can carry 6,000 to 10,000 gallons of product. It's non-pressurized, made of aluminum or steel, and has several safety features, including full rollover protection and remote emergency shutoff valves. And then you have the DOT 407 chemical hauler, and it's similar to the 406. It's a round or horseshoe shaped. It holds 6,000 to 7,000 gallons of liquid. It's tractor drawn and transports flammable liquids, mild corrosives, and poisons. It may be insulated or uninsulated and may have higher internal working pressure, so up to 35 PSI. And then you have the DOT 4012 corrosive tanker, and it's commonly used to transport corrosives. So it's smaller diam diameter than the DOT 406 or DOT 407. It can be identified by the presence of several heavy duty reinforcing rings around the tank. It operates at approximately 15 to 25 PSI, and it can hold approximately 6,000 gallons. And then you have the MC331 pressure cargo tanker. It carries hazardous materials like ammonia, propane, freon, and butane. The tank's capacity varies from 1,000 gallons to 1,100 or 11,000 gallons. It has rounded ends. It's constructed of steel or stainless steel. It has a single tank compartment. It operates at about 300 PSI. And um, there is an explosive hazard if the tank is impinged on by a fire. And then you have the cryogenic tanker. It's a low pressure tanker that relies on tank insulation to maintain the low temperature required for the cryogens. So the control valves are usually in the box-like structure on the rear of the tanker. Small puffs of white vapors are vented from the control valves. Tube trailers carry compressed gases like hydrogen, oxygen, helium, and methane. They are high volume transportation vehicles. They are made of several individual cylinders banded together and fixed to a trailer. They operate at working pressures of 3,000 to 5,000 PSI so high um, PSI, one trailer can carry several different gases in individual tubes. The valve control box is usually found on the rear of the trailer, and each individual cylinder has its own relief valve. And then you have bulk cargo. These are dry tanks, and they carry bulk goods such as powders, pellets, fertilizer, and grain. They're not pressurized and they usually have a V shape with rounded sides. Okay, so let's talk about establishing safety zones. Know the safety perimeters for hazardous materials that are toxic and those that pose a fire or explosion danger. Take the following steps if you are dispatched to a hazardous materials incident. Of course, protect yourself first, Isolate the incident as much as possible to avoid further harm. Notify your dispatcher of any other EMS fire law enforcement responders and inform incoming responders of what you observe about the wind direction, terrain, and a safe response route. As the incident progresses, hazardous material specialists will establish hot, warm, and cold zones. Remember that the hot zone is a contamination zone. The warm zone surrounds the hot zone, and the cold zone is the buffer from the hazards in the hot and warm zones. Now, paramedics usually perform triage and patient transport in the cold zone. Observe the initial isolation and protection distances. And the hazardous materials team will use air monitoring equipment to determine the explosive limits, oxygen levels, and the concentration of hydrogen sulfide and the concentration of carbon monoxide. Hazardous materials team can determine the pH of spills. And computer-aided emergency 
a management of emergency operations is one of the many programs that help predict downwind concentrations of hazardous materials. It uses input of environmental factors into a computer model, and it helps predict the size and direction of gas or vapor clouds. Be familiar with the personal protective equipment used at hazardous materials scenes. So usually the hazardous materials team or trained responders will determine the appropriate PPE needed for the specific incident. You should recognize certain levels or combinations of PPE and understand what hazards the people inside those garments are facing. Considering heat-related or cooled-related issues or potential health risks and how to treat an exposure. Protective clothing is classified as level A through level D. So let's talk about these. This is a level A, and this assemble requires um, the greatest respiratory and skin protection. It covers the full body and has a self-contained breathing apparatus or other supplemental air system. You may need to monitor this technician for heat stress. And you should know how to get in and out of these uh, garments in case you need to provide patient care. This is a level B, and it's used when a high level of respiratory protection is needed and there is no threat of skin uh, absorption. It's not fully encapsulating. It's worn with a self-contained breathing apparatus and usually worn by responders who are performing decon. Then there's level C, and this is designed to protect against a known substance. It provides minimal splash protection. It's worn with an air purifying respirator, and it's worn by exposed patients in an emergency department and law enforcement protecting the perimeter. And then there's the level D. It's usually worn by personnel working in the cold zone, worn when there is little to no threat by the released substance and there's no respiratory protection other than a dust mask. The NFPA does not certify any garments. Certification is common misperception in the hazardous materials and weapons of mass destruction response industry. The intent of the NFPA clothing standard is to provide guidance on manufacturing quality and performance standards. The OSHA HAZWOPPER Regulation 29 CFR 1910, 120 Appendix B of the OSHA HAZWOPPER Regulation offers guidance on which level of chemical protection to use and the conditions under which the various levels of protection should be chosen. Okay, so let's get into the contamination and toxicology. Hazardous materials getting into the body and interfering with the body's processes. So the harm caused by hazardous material is affected by the route of exposure, the dose and concentration, how long the toxin was in contact with the body, and whether it exhibits acute or delayed toxicity. If the patient has a chronic pre-existing condition as well. Okay, so let's talk about the primary contamination is a direct exposure of the patient, and secondary contamination is transfer of hazardous materials to a person from another person. When we talk about routes of exposure, the physical properties of the hazardous material and the physical surroundings can expose a patient in different ways. There are four primary methods of entry, and they're ingestion, inhalation, injection, and absorption, other factors that can affect treatment are the air temperature, the concentration of the hazard, and the amount of time a patient was exposed. A local effect is reddening of the skin. A systemic effect is damage that occurs inside the body. You need to identify the exposed or scenario and substances involved and provide support care during transport. So some hazardous materials can have significant adverse reactions or effects on the neurologic, renal, or hepatic systems. Effects may be seen immediately or not for hours or years later. 
So your records should indicate the elements required by the authority having jurisdiction or medical director, description of the scene, anything you were told about the substance, how your patient looked initially, treatment rendered, and the positive or negative changes since the initial contact. The dose effect principle applies no matter what the route or type of exposure is. And so the greater the length of time or the greater the concentration of the material, the greater the effect probability will be on the body. The cycle of poison action includes absorption, delivery to target organs, binding to those organs, and the biotransformation and elimination of the toxin through the GI tract, kidney, or respiratory systems. So let's talk about some chemical terms. Vapor pressure is the amount of pressure in the airspace between the top of the liquid and the container it is held inside. The vapors released must be contained in order to exert pressure. Vapor pressure directly correlates to the speed at which the material will evaporate once it is released from the container. So evaporation increases when air or pavement temperature is elevated. And evaporation rates are also influenced by wind speed, shade, humidity, and surface area of the spill. So we just talked about vapor pressure. Now this is vapor density. It's a comparison of the hazardous material gas to air. Air has a vapor density of one. So if the gas is heavier than the air, it will sink into little valleys and ditches and propane and butane and carbon dioxide are heavier than air. If the gas is lighter than air, it rises and dissipates such as um, methane or hydrogen, those are lighter than air. This is why you should approach a scene from uphill and upwind. Okay, so now the next chemical term we're gonna talk about is flash point. The temperature at which liquid fuel gives off sufficient vapors that when an ignition source is present, it will result in a flash fire. Flash fires will go out once the vapor fuel is consumed. So responders should be mindful of the ignition sources at flammable and combustion liquid incidents. Low flash point liquids typically have high vapor pressures and they can be expected to produce a sufficient amount of flammable vapors. So now let's talk about ignition temperature, and that's the temperature at which liquid fuel will ignite without an external ignition source. It's also flammable range. That's the fuel-air mixture that reflects an amount of flammable vapor mixed with a given volume of air. And so if a given fuel-air mixture falls between the upper and lower flammable limits, and it reaches an ignition source, there will be a flash fire. Hazardous materials team, in many cases, can cool down the heat or dissipate the concentration of vapors with cool water. Before the water is applied, the team will decide if the material may be water reactive or water soluble. So the next, uh, term we're going to talk about is a threshold limit value, and it's the maximum concentration of a toxin that someone can be exposed to for a 40-hour work week over a typical 30-year career. It's established by the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, and it's a permiss permissible exposure limit, a corresponding value established by OSHA. Threshold limit value or short-term exposure limit is the concentration a person can be exposed to for a limited number of brief time periods. The threshold limit value ceiling is a concentration that a person should never be exposed to. And the threshold limit value skin is significant exposure from absorption due to direct or airborne contact with the material. 
lethal dose, or LD, is a single dose that causes uh, the death of a specific number of the group of test animals exposed. And lethal concentration, or LC, is the concentration of the material in the air that is expected to kill a, a specific number of the group of a test animals when administered over time. Okay, so the next two slides have the definitions of toxic, and it talks about the chemical, um, the milligrams per kilogram, and who it's, it, it's administered to. So um, it talks about rats and then rabbits. And then, of course, um, uh, this slide talks about the milligrams per liter um, when administered by inhalation. So it just defines the toxic, that term. Highly toxic is the next definition, and it says the specifics of the milligrams and the weight of, uh, of the test animals. And then immediately dangerous to life and health. Atmospheric concentration of any toxic, corrosive, or asphyxiant substance that will pose an immediate threat to life, irreversible or delayed adverse effects, or serious interference for a team member's attempt to escape. When it comes to decontamination and treatment, Understanding the situation before beginning to treat a patient at a hazmat scene is important. So you must keep yourself safe, which can take discipline and emotional coolness. Decontamination is the highest priority when a substance provides an unacceptable risk to responders. Patients must be decontaminated before they are given treatment. Let's talk about some of the decontamination methods, and they're gonna depend on the type of the hazardous material involved, the stability of the scene, and the number, condition, and location of the patients. Consider the protection of the environment while decontaminating as well, and make sure you, that you have plans to contain the runoff, and this is a secondary when lives are at stake, however. There are four common types of decontamination methods that are used in the field. So there's the dilution, uh, and this is most common method and easiest to perform. It just relies on copious amounts of water to flush the contaminant from the skin or eyes. Next is absorption. This is accomplished with large pads that soak up the liquid and remove it from the patient, such as towels. And then there's neutralization. So neutralization involves a chemical to change the hazardous material into a less harmful substance. And then there's disposal. This is more of a result of the decontamination process to remove as much of the patient's clothing as possible in order to reduce the amount of contamination that uh, contacts the body. Simply removing the clothing can reduce the level of contamination by as much as 80% to 90%. In some cases, you may need to make an immediate decision to treat patients despite the contamination. So you must always ensure that you have the appropriate protection. Emergency decontamination is the process of removing the bulk of contaminates from a person as quickly and completely as possible. Okay, so you could brush off powder or give the person bags to put their personal belongings in. And water from available resources is most often the universal decontamination solution. When it comes to mass decontamination, firefighters can set up hose streams to perform mass decon. A decontamination corridor, and that's like a controlled area, can be set up um, in warm zones by parking two fire engines parallel to each other and approximately 10 to 30 feet apart, 20 feet apart. Nozzles can be attached to each discharge port and set up to create a fine particle fog stream decon shower. Technical decon is the thorough cleaning process used by responders to clean PPE, tools, and equipment using cleaning solutions, scrub brushings, brushes, and decontamination corridors. The following steps are, and um, 
indication of a technical decon process. So the responders exit the hot zone, they approach the decon corridor, contaminated tools and equipment should be left in the hot zone, hazardous materials personnel are showered and washed, paramedics stay alert for signs of ongoing primary or potential secondary contamination problems, Team members move into an area of the decon corridor where another member of the decon team helps them out of their PPE. Respirators and self-contained breathing apparatus, masks are, and undergloves are removed and placed in plastic bags. Ideally, responders proceed to the location where they can take a personal shower and entry teams personnel undergo medical evaluations. So when we talk about treatment of patients exposed to hazmat or hazardous materials, invasive procedures should be minimized if possible, such as endotracheal tube intubation. It may expose the patients uh, to airway contamination or placement of IV or IO may allow contaminants to bypass the skin barrier. So weigh the risks against the benefits. Familiarize yourself with references and how to assess technical ex expertise when demanding or deciding how to treat patients. Assist, um, assistance may be obtained through the ERG or Chemtrek. You could also consult agencies such as poison control centers or local medical control. Corrosives, acids and bases. So Corrosives are chemicals that include both acids and bases, such as toilet bowl cleaner or lye or hydrochloric acid. Acids have a low pH and bases have a high pH. Substances with either high or low pH can cause severe burns to the skin, eyes, and mucous membranes. Okay, so once the patient is decontaminated, treatment is support such as um, enter the airway and oxygenate. Treatment for pain if needed. Always consult medical control to determine the proper course of action when treating patients with chemical exposures. Next, we're gonna talk about solvents. So they could be liquid, solids, or gases. Common solvents are paint thinners or nail polish removers. Solvents are capable of dissolving other substances and many give off uh, vapors that can be inhaled or absorbed. Respiratory exposure in particular can cause immediate pulmonary symptoms such as pulmonary edema. And exposures may require extensive decontamination to the point where it is considered a form of treatment. Some of, uh, they can be um, metabolized into other toxic substances once absorbed into the body. So pay special attention to the potential for vomiting if a substance is or solvent is ingestion. Okay, so the next we're gonna talk about is pesticides. And it can cause runaway nervous system stimulation. The stimulation in turn produces a collection of signs known as the, the mnemonic dumbbells. And so it stands for diarrhea, urination, meiosis or muscle weakness, bradycardia or bronchospasms, emesis, lacrimation, seizures, salivation or sweating. Exposures can produce tachycardia or bradycardia, twitching muscles or excessive pulmonary secretions. Treatment of pesticides poisoning includes aggressive decon, protection of the airway, high flow O2, and the use of atropine to block the overstimulation of the receptors of the parasympathetic nervous system. Chemical asphyxiants interfere with the use of oxygen at the cellular level. An asphyxiant is any gas that displaces oxygen from the atmosphere. And cyanide is a common example. Treatment for cyanide exposure is, um, so this is for a non-smoke inhalation patient. It's uh, patients should inhale amyl nitrate ampules for 15 seconds every minute. 
follow with an IV administration of 300 milligrams of sodium nitrate, followed by 12.5 of sodium thiosphate. Follow the instructions found in the cyanide antidote kit for definitive treatment. Carbon monoxide is another common cause of uh, chemical asphyxiation. It ties up the hemoglobin to the extent that oxygen in the blood becomes inaccessible to the cells. Treatment includes removal of the patient from the source and consider transport to emergency department with the hyperbaric oxygen capabilities. Toxic products of combustion are hazardous chemical compounds released when a material decomposes under heat. So toxic gases are liberated during a residential structure fire. Remember the phrase garbage in, garbage out. Whatever objects are involved in a fire will break down in heat and a host of chemical byproducts are created and found in smoke. So burning wood gives off more than 70 harmful chemical compounds. Other toxic substances found in most fire smoke include soot, monoxide, dioxide, water vapor, cyanide compounds, and many oxides of nitrogen. Carbon monoxide affects the ability of the body to transport oxygen, like we said earlier. Cyanide compounds affect oxygen uptake, and oxides of nitrogen are deep lung irritants and can cause pulmonary edema or fluid buildup in the lung. So when you talk about transporting these patients, it is ideal to have paramedics who are not involved in the decontamination or cold zone patient treatment standing by to transport patients to the emergency department. Do not assume that the patients received after the field decon are completely decontaminated. Wear appropriate PPE if indicated and be trained to wear the level required. You should be given a complete report from the hazardous materials team. And you should never transport a patient if there hasn't been significant decon done. Before transporting the patients, you can prepare in several ways. So reduce the amount of supplies and equipment that the patient will contact. Plan to wrap the patient in a plastic barrier to reduce the potential of secondary contamination. And give the emergency department plenty of notice prior to transport so that it can properly train personnel together and prepare equipment. medical monitoring and rehab. So you may be asked to assist with medical monitoring of hazmat team members. PPE often causes heat stress and toxins uh, the team is working with can cause serious health effects. So factors that influence the hazardous materials team members health include the level of physical fitness, the activity, the level of PPE, and the environment factors like let's say temperature. Medical monitoring includes documenting the incident factors, which includes the hazardous material involved, the toxic effects, the PPE worn, the PPE's resistance to permeability with hazardous materials, and the type of decon used. Have a planned treatment, transport, and the potential availability of antidotes. You may assess the hazardous materials team before they enter and after they leave the hot zone. So you should assess them for the complete set of vitals, an ECG possibly, and temperature and body weight. Team members should prehydrate with water or sports drinks. Before they re-enter the hot zone, they need to be evaluated again for their hydration status and vital signs and any symptoms for the potential exposure to the toxic agent. Team members should remove their protective clothing and be given time to rest, reassess vital signs, and perform a neurologic assessment. Okay, so that concludes Chapter 49, Hazardous Materials Lecture.
Thank you for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed it.